Hey, this is Stephen Platinum, your friend in wrestling with Platinum versus AEW Dynamite. This is not the Late Night Dynamite, which I also did a report on, so you can take a look at that if you'd like after this. But this is the one that took place last night at September 23rd, 2020. Um, so they've had um, a couple of bad shows in a row. And then last week they rebounded in a big, big way. How was this week's show? They need an adult in the room. It's a constant theme I have with AEW. It was not a bad show. Um, and especially when you had to, they had to deal with the COVID stuff, which I will give them credit for tackling head on and um, just remaking matches and doing it with personnel that could pull that kind of thing off. I'm thinking specifically of Eddie Kingston, just being able to go out there, get on the mic, and all of a sudden him having a match with Moxley seems like a phenomenal idea in lieu of the uh, six-man that we were supposed to have. Um, things like that I don't bust their balls about, but there's just little things happening that just make you scratch your head and just make you realize like they really do need one more person there to just bounce stuff off of and help them um, kind of mine their P's and Q's a little bit and get the maximum effect out of what they're trying to do, which overall I think is very good. I enjoy the AEW product quite a bit. I just want to see them tighten these things up before they become major problems. So we, um, uh, we open with a, a tribute to Road Warrior Animal, which I think is very nice and appropriate. Then we have our dynamite open, lots of color, lots of energy, and we're off to the races. We're going to have Moxley versus Kingston for the AEW title. And then the former main event is now not no longer the main event, but still a title match nonetheless, as the TNT champion Brody Lee is going to take on Orange Cassidy. Wow. We open the show with Kip Sabian and Penelope. So, in theory, we're going to get Miro's first match in AEW. And sure enough, they're going to be at a tag match against Sunny Kiss and Joey Janela. This was a kind of a sloppy affair. Um, Sunny Kiss looked really, really good in it. Um, I liked the promo that they played on video as Sunny Kiss and Joey Janela were coming to the ring. Um, where Janela was mocking things. Uh, the match went on as it does. I like that AEW does not cut away during the first match, but we get it in its entirety. And Miro um, looks very dominant and then eventually wins with the uh, camel clutch, whatever they're calling it here. Um, as they, everybody, the major players go to the locker room, out comes Eddie Kingston and cuts a really great promo, basically implying Moxley's a sellout. And Moxley comes out and they square off head to head and get separated and it is on. Awesome. Go to commercial. We come back. Kenny, Mo Kenny Omega gets an entrance. He's going to commentate. And I guess that means we're going to have a Hangman Adam Page solo match as they do the slow burn continues between those two. And yes, we have Evil Uno of the Dark Order against Hangman Adam Page. They get a split screen with a commercial. Um, it's a good match. It's a good look for Hangman Adam Page. He wins with the Buckshot Lariat. No fuss. No muss. The Young Bucks are there with Tony Schiavone, who's trying to interview them. Tony asks them some hard questions, and uh, they respond. Matt asks for, um, Matt Jackson asks for Tony Schiavone's phone and then breaks it. Wow, assholes. Okay. Commercial break. We come back. Orange Cassidy against Brody Lee. Oh boy, here we go. Um, I like that Jim Ross points out the fact that Brody Lee only needed three minutes and ten seconds to demolish Cody. Reminding of, of that is a good look. Um, Brody Lee dominates this match until he doesn't. Uh, I thought the Orange Cassidy thing where he kept like, I'm too hurt to stand up for your discus clothesline, which confused Brody Lee, which really led to his comeback, was really good. At the end of the day, though, Brody Lee does hit the discus clothesline and get the pin. Cody returns, beats up that Dark Order, especially waylays poor Alan Angels uh, as Dark Order number five hurts his leg on the pole and then puts him on the R on the post and then puts him in the figure four and then announces he is back. Brody Lee is back there uh, because he rabbited as soon as Cody showed up. Um, Again, this is one of those detail things, right? So he cuts a really scathing promo on Cody, 
how his wife sets thirst traps on Instagram, which made me laugh. Um, though it did sound awfully like modern speak for Brody Lee and what he's going for, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and then, um, because Brody Lee conveys this sort of all-powerful authority figure, but then he sounds like a, like younger than he's supposed to be when he says things like thirst trap. I don't know. Again, am I nitpicking? Well, that's what I do. And again, I think you need an adult in the room to go like, think about think about conveying something else. And then he just busts a dog collar out of nowhere, like a challenge, basically challenging Cody to a dog collar match. Again, just. It feels just really ramshackle and very indie, and and that's not what they're looking for. And there's a way to get there, but again, I think they need one person to sort of bounce these things off of and go like, okay, if you want to get there, maybe we can do it in this way or that way. Commercial, we come back. Um, this is when the Brody Lee promo took place. One detail that I liked was Dasha was there to interview and then Anna Jay just removes her. I don't know if this is to set up something between Dasha and Anna Jay, but, I, but the possibility was raised and I find it interesting. I find that Anna Jay is sort of there to sort of take care of the women that are in the Dark Order's way. Um, then we go to a thing with Matt Hardy and Private Party. Matt Hardy comes to the ring. Um, says he suspects that Jericho is the one that waylaid him with his baseball bat, but he doesn't know for sure. Out comes Jericho, um, really cocky, has the whole inner circle with him, brings back Sammy Guevara, in fact, after implying that he's not there. Um, they're just having a good old time. One challenge happens after another. Matt Hardy, obviously, is not clear to wrestle yet. Um, then... One of private party says he'll fight, but then Isaiah Cassidy steps up. He's the guy that we really haven't seen have a solo thing. Marquis had a great match against Cody, but now Isaiah is saying he wants to challenge Chris Jericho. So I guess it's going to take place next week. Commercial. We come back. Um, again, just so many promos that where there's some detail that's just really odd. And this FTR one with Tully Blanchard where Tully says from now on their matches are going to be 20 minute time limits and then we pick the opponents. Again, what are the rules of this world? Is it Tony Khan, who everybody always cites as doling out the title matches? Now Tully Blanchard just gets to pick. I mean, it's 20 minute, eliminate, 20 minute time limits. And I get wanting to put heel heat on FTR and set up the possibilities that you can have some finishes that are just time limit draws, but man, the way they just ham-handedly go about everything. Some people will say, does it really matter? It does, because these are the kind of things that add up to big problems, but more importantly are symptomatic of a bigger problem, which is the need for an adult in the room to bounce these things off of, to help them smooth them out. They're in so many ways AEW superior to WWE, but why not create more opportunities? And, and having things go smoothly and having things make sense is just another advantage that you can clearly have. Uh, FTR does say they're gonna, that they're going to allow, um, they're going to challenge SCU to wrestle them for the titles. Um, well, I don't even know for the titles. Like nothing is clear at a later date. They call best friends backyard wrestlers. Trent says that was a war. FTR sort of belittles that. And then let's get a referee in here and then they bow out. Like, so you can do things like that to get heel heat without just upending the rules of this world. So it's like, can anybody who's a champion just dictate completely how they're going to defend and who they're going to defend against? I suppose that you can. Um, I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. I guess that's what it comes down to. A number of things that happened just didn't have that. They just didn't survive the smell test, if that makes sense. And uh, we show a bunch of clips about the what has been brewing betwixt Ivelisse Diamante, Thunder Rosa, and Hikaru Shida. Um, that sets up their tag match tonight. Ivelisse and Diamante jumping Thunder Rosa and Hikaru Shida right from the jump. I thought was a good look. It sort of differentiated very clearly who was the face and who was the heel. AEW often assumes that everybody who watches them knows exactly what's going on all the time. And it's nice that they sort of set some precedence here. Okay, these are the heels. These are the faces. <laughs> Let's go from there. Um, a number of spots in this match are really wonky. And a number of things that happen where, like, somebody's going for a pin and then 
somebody else realizes they're not the legal person and so they have a discussion about it. I mean, that kind of stuff just makes it look so ramshackle and um, not as good as it should be. Um, the, the work between the four women is fine for what it is. Um, I did like the spot where Rosa has the miscue and accidentally knees Sheeta which seems to open up the possibility of something later, but they get it together and Sheeta wins with that running knee and we're off to the races. Um, Jericho and MJF have another great bit where it's like oh, the bit where they go, you're great. Why did you call me a loser? And then they both sort of in a very heelish, weaselly way justify that they well, no, I didn't call you a loser. I called Tony Schiavone a loser or I called this person a loser. Um, I thought it was great, but then they, they, there's clearly a tension there, and MJF looks right being there with Jericho, who is um, one of their de facto top guys, and I think that's very smart as well. Again, when they do these kind of things, they tend to work, but they're not worried about other details, and sometimes they want to get to what they want to get to and aren't interested in the details to get there, and that's what I have issue with. But this Jericho-MJF thing totally worked for me. Um, we set up that Jericho is indeed going to wrestle Isaiah Cassidy of Private Party next week. Britt Baker is going to make an appearance. FTR is going to go against SCU. Um, Darby Allen is finally going to have this match with Ricky Starks. John Moxley is going to have an appearance as well. And at the pay-per-view, then they show this accidentally. And I'm the only person that I noticed caught this. I looked around the internet today to see, did anybody else catch this? Um, that it's going to be Archer and Moxley and Kingston. So then I go like, oh, so we're going to have some kind of indeterminate finish? Is that why Kingston would be a part of this match? And whoever accidentally flubbed and put that up, dude, again, adults in the room, they got to catch these things. Um, we have our main event, Kingston and Moxley. It's really good. The split screen is some of the better stuff we've seen during the split screen commercial thing. Just a lot of action. They're really going at it. Moxley eventually wins with the Bulldog choke that he beats uh, Brody Lee with, but Kingston didn't officially tap out, but referee stopped it. So I guess that's the in for Kingston to eventually... If they do Kingston, Archer, and Moxley, then I'm not crazy, and they, in fact, put that graphic up. Um, then it's chaos. The Lucha Brothers come and attack Moxley. Right? Will Hobbs comes out, kicks butt for a little while, but eventually they get overwhelmed by numbers. I guess Butcher and Blade are not there. Uh, but they're getting overwhelmed by numbers. And then Darby Allen comes to even the odds, but then immediately gets speared out of his boots by Ricky Starks. Boy, I am looking forward to that match between the two of them. Um, I just hope neither one of them get hurt badly. <laughs> Um, there's definitely overtones of like the Hardy Guevara feud where it seems like, God, these guys just keep hurting each other. And you're getting that vibe with Darby and Ricky Starks as well. But it's a, it's a match that can really elevate the both of them. So chaos ensues and that brings us to the end of the show. So I know I had a number of things to say. I advise listening to them. Um, because hey, I want AEW to succeed, obviously, um, but I feel like these little things are going to add up to problems later on and are perhaps an indication of something that they already need that they do not have. But I will continue to watch and you will continue to listen and I appreciate you for it. This is Stephen Scarborough, your friend in wrestling with Platinum versus AEW Dynamite.